Praise the Lord. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. Or I saw as we pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for our Bible study tonight. We thank you because you have granted us this privilege to always come, to listen to your word and to study together. And we pray, Lord, that your power will come with the word tonight in every heart in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that everything that you teach us, our hearts will receive. Or take proper, appropriate decision on what you are teaching us tonight in Jesus' name. That it will not be a waste of effort. It will not be a waste of time. That you are spending this quality time to instruct us in the way of righteousness. And in the way where we ought to be and what we ought to do. And we pray, Lord, that the word will bear fruit in every life and everyone in the church in Jesus' name. We bless your name because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you very much. You can be seated. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study tonight. In Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen. And for those who are just coming for the first time, what a great time of appointment you have with the Lord. Bible study time is precious time. And it's a wonderful time. And you will soon discover as you come week after week how the Lord blesses your life. How the Lord enriches your life. And then you are able to do the will of God in your life. I'm reading to you from Acts chapter 8. We're reading verses 5 all through to 8. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies, paralysis, and what our lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. You find in verse 5 the mention of one name. That name is Philip. And that Philip is given to us as an example, as a model, as an illustration, as a demonstrator of an evangelist. If you look at Acts chapter 21, verse 8. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed, and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist. We entered into the house of Philip the Evangelist, which was one of the seven, and abode with him. We want to make a contrast between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Between the Old Testament on the one hand, and the New Testament on the other hand. Between the evangelist of the Old Testament and the evangelist of the New Testament. Therefore, you are going to open your Bible to Jonah chapter 1. While you put your finger in Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Because we are making a contrast between Jonah and Philip. Number 1. Both of them, that is both Jonah and Philip received the commission of the Lord and they received a responsibility. Jonah chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness is come up before me. you find your words in verse 2 that are very important. Arise, go. Arise, get up. And go. You come to Acts of the Apostles chapter 8, verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go. The same words. Arise, get up, and go. Toward the south of the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is the desert. And so you find, number one, both of them had the same responsibility. Number two, you come to Jonah chapter 1 verse 3. 
But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found the ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fear thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. We'll see Jonah's refusal. But let us look at Philip. We're looking at Acts chapter 8, verse 27. And he arose, and he went, and behold, the man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, will find the response of Philip. On the side of Jonah, refusal. On the side of Philip, response. Which tells us, as a New Testament believer, you do not behave like the Old Testament people, like the Old Testament missionaries, like the Old Testament evangelists. In the case of Jonah, refusal. In the case of Philip, response. Number three, we look at Jonah chapter 1 verse 4. But the Lord sent a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea, so that the sheep was like to be broken. That's the judgment of God. That's retribution or the wrath of God. Because of refusal, because of the rejection of the will of God, the rejection of the great commission, the Lord had given him to go to Nineveh. Retribution followed after him. The wrath of God followed after him. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8 verse 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. That's revelation. The Lord revealed to him, The reason you came out of that place, and I brought you to this place, is so you can join this chariot. In the case of Jonah, retribution and wrath of God. In the case of Philip, we have revelation. Then come back to Jonah chapter 1 verse 5. Then the mariners were afraid. And he cried every man to his God, and cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea, to lighten each of them. But Jonah was gone down into the sides of the ship, and lay and was fast asleep. Here we find rest of inactivity, or the relaxation of inactivity. He ought to have been up and doing Getting something done for the glory of God. And he responds in obedience to the watch of the Lord. To carry out the responsibility the Lord had given him. Instead of that, he went into the rest and relaxation of inactivity. Let's, let's come to Acts of the Apostles chapter 8, verse 30. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah's. And said, Understandest thou what thou readest? We have the running of activity, running into activity. You see, in the case of Jonah, it was rest and relaxation. In the case of Philip, it was running, running into duty, and running into responsibility, and running into the activity the Lord had called him to. I'm showing you something between the old and the new. Between the people that resist, that refuse, that reject, and the people that respond. And they have the revelation of God upon them, and immediately they have that revelation. Here is what you do. You run with it. That's the New Testament response. That's the new covenant responsibility coming upon you as a worker, as a soul winner, as an evangelist. Number five, we we'll see Jonah chapter 1 verse 6. In Jonah chapter 1 verse 6, And the ship master came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Arise, call upon thy God. If so be that God will seek upon us that we perish not. Here we find rebuke from a sinner. Instead of Jonah being a blessing to the mariners, being a blessing to the sailors, he got a rebuke from them. A rebuke from the sinners. Acts chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 30 again. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah. 
and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. We have request from a sinner. In the case of Jonah, it was rebuke coming from a sinner. How you see it was sleeping. Look at the difficulty and the danger in which we are. Arise, so sleeper, and come upon thy and call upon thy God. A rebuke. But in the case of Philip, it was requested that he will come into that chariot so that he can be a blessing to interpret and to preach the word of God unto this eunuch. Number six, we're looking at jo Jonah chapter one, reading from verse seven. And they said, everyone to his fellow, come, and let us cast lots, that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots, and, lot, and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then said they unto him, tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thine occupation? And whence comest thou? What is thy country? And what and of what people art thou? And he said unto them, I am an Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which has made the sea and the dry land. And they were, they, then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Here we find realization and reproof. They realized that it was because of Jonah. They were having all that problem upon them. Realization and reproof. Then they said, you shouldn't have done that. Why did you do that? Why are you running away from responsibility or for what the Lord has told you to do? And now we come to Acts of the Apostles. I'm reading from verse 31. Acts chapter 8, verse 31. And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a, as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from him. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speakest the prophet this? Of himself or of some other man? Here we find recognition and respect. You see, the eunuch recognized, he, he recognized Philip, that you can instruct me. You can teach me recognition and respect. He had respect for him. And then finally, Jonah chapter 1 verse 15. So, they took up Jonah and cast him forth into the sea. And the sea ceased from a raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered his sacrifice unto the Lord and made vows you have their rejection and reverence they rejected Jonah they threw him overboard into the sea but they had reverence for God and they made vows unto the Lord come to Acts chapter 8 I'm reading from verse 35 then opened Philip then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus and as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. There you have re receptivity and redemption. The man received, I believe, Jesus Christ is the very Son of God. And then you find that they went into the river, and then he was baptized in water. He was saved. He was redeemed, re receptivity and redemption. Do you see why we're coming to this? Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. It's so that as we study the book of Jonah, 
you will see that what the Lord is showing us is the difference there ought to be. The contrast there ought to be between the old and the new. And then if you are resisting the will of God, if you are rejecting the will of God, and if you are running away and fleeing like Jonah, then you will know you're still back in the old covenant. Come on to the New Testament and understand in the New Testament we have a good example and a good model of a man called of God like Jonah was called. But in his own case, he responded appropriately. He received a revelation from the Lord. He received recognition and respect and then his labor was fruitful. Now we come to Acts chapter 8. This Philip was one of the seven spirit-filled men chosen to help in food distribution in the early church. Though Stephen and some others ministered as effectively as Philip did, yet he is the only one that is referred to as an evangelist in the New Testament. Yes, there were other evangelists because we are told in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. There were other evangelists because the Lord gave some the duty and the work and the ministry and the power of the evangelists. And yet there's just one example, one model given to us. That's the model of the evangelist Philip. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 5. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, and do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. Do the work of an evangelist. You cannot plan fully the work of an evangelist by keeping to Jonah alone. But when you come to Philip, then you understand the work of an evangelist. And what does the work of the evangelist comprise of? Number one, the witness of the evangelist. The witness of the evangelist that is declaring the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior and as Redeemer, as Healer, as Deliverer. Number two, the whereabouts of the evangelist. That means the places that the evangelist actually goes, the whereabouts of the evangelist. He left Jerusalem and then he came to Samaria and was in many places in Samaria preaching the word of God. Number three, we have the willingness of the evangelist. As you look at Philip the evangelist, in the New Testament you see the willingness. Immediately the Lord said, arise and go. He arose and he went. Number four, the winsomeness of the evangelist. The winsomeness, that means uh, that winsome character, or winsome appearance, or winsome approach, or winsome communication. He immediately presented the word. He won the people over. Number five, the wisdom of the evangelist. That man was wise. Whether I was dealing with a crowd in Samaria or he was dealing with an individual on the way to Gaza in the desert, in the chariot, he was wise. Number six, the warfare and the weapon of the evangelist. When he got to Samaria, he discovered there was a sorcerer there. And that sorcerer was not able to destroy his work, was not able to dissuade the people. I was not able to keep on deceiving the people, the warfare, and the weapon of the evangelist. Number seven, the wonders of the evangelist. Signs and wonders taking place through the ministry of that evangelist. Look at Acts chapter 8 verse 13. Acts chapter 8 verse 13. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. And so, as we come to this evangelist, we see that the evangelist preaches the gospel. He preaches, number one, the necessity of the new birth. He must be born again. Number two, the simplicity of the new birth. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Number three, the certainty of the new life. The certainty of the new life. And then the Lord confirms his words, the preaching, the message, was signs following. I divide the message to three parts. Number one, the mandate of the evangelist. The mandate of the evangelist. Number two, the message of the evangelist. The message of the evangelist. Number three, the ministration. The ministration of the ministry of the evangelist. Let's come back to number one. The mandate of 
the evangelist. When we talk about mandate, we're talking about the commission. We're talking about the commandment. We're talking about the responsibility that the Lord has laid upon the evangelist. You look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. You see the mandate, you see the commission, you see the commandment, you see the responsibility. Number one, they were to witness in Jerusalem and witness in Judea and in particular witness in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now, as we look at their commission and we look at their, the commandment that was given to them, Let's look at our own commission. I want you to do something on your mind. I'm, I'm going to deal with those two words. On the one hand, Samaria. On the other hand, the world. Because you see for us today, there's no Samaria literally to go to. But the commission to them included Samaria. For you and for me, what does that Samaria translate to? I'll show you from the word of God. It's the world. But let's look at this. It says, you will be a witness unto me in Jerusalem. And in all Judea, in particular now, in Samaria. I want you to look at Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. And he said unto them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. When you see Philip going to Samaria, the pictures should come in your mind. You are to go to the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Come back to Acts of the Apostles chapter 8 verse 5. Acts chapter 8 verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Remember, every time you see that they carried out their commission and they went to Samaria, you are to interpret that to mean that you go to where? You go to the world. Here it says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria. I want you to look at Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. We're looking at verse 18. But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily. Their sound went into all the earth and their words unto the ends of the world. Their words to the ends of the world. So, as we reach a day that the mandate was given, and the mandate that uh, Philip was carrying was the mandate to take the gospel, the message of Christ, and take it to Samaria. And then the mandate for you is to take that same gospel. Take that same evangel and take that same good news and take it from where you are and take it to the world. Now we're going to make some comparisons between Samaria and the world. That helps you to understand what the commission is, what the assignment is, what the responsibility is, and what the duty on every Christian, every believer, what that duty is. Let me get you back to the beginning of the time when Samaria actually came into focus in the history of the children of Israel. In 1 Kings chapter 16, 1 Kings chapter 16, I'm reading from verse 29. 1 Kings chapter, 20, chapter 16, verse 29. And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Omri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over, over Israel in Samaria. That's when this city, Samaria, came into focus and came into historical record. 20 and 2 years did Ahab reign in Bastachi. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as, it had been, as if it had been a light thing, a small thing, a little thing, an insignificant thing, for him to walk in the seas of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, 
king of the Sidonians, and went and sat Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal, him in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a group. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Here is the historical record we have about Samaria that Ahab reigned there. And he reigned for these many years there. He actually did evil, much evil than everybody else. So he perpetrated evil and penetrated the city of Samaria with that evil and made everybody there evil. And so that's the reason why the Samaritans needed the gospel. Because they were evil. But you remember, we're comparing and contrasting Samaria with the world. So that you can see our own commission. We're looking at John chapter 3 verse 19. John 3, 19. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Samaria, evil. The world, evil. And Philip went to that evil Samaria and preached the good news unto them. And many of them left their evil deeds and they came to the Lord. And we children of God, now we understand the world is evil, like Samaria was evil. And we are to take the good news, the gospel, the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, and take it to that evil world. And then penetrate the evil world with the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ and turn many unto the Lord. Let's come to First Kings chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 51. We're still looking at Samaria and we look at Samaria on the one hand and then we look at the world on the other hand. So that you'll be able to see the assignment, the duty. The responsibility, the calling, the commission that you have received in First Kings chapter 22, verse 51. And Ahaziah, the son of Ahab, began to reign over Israel in Samaria, the seventeenth year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and reigned two years over Israel. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and he walked in the way of his father. And in the way of his mother, and in the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. And he sat Baal and worshipped him. We now come to another area of the lifestyle that you have in Samaria. It was the worship of Baal, the worship of idol, the worship of a false god. It says, he sat Baal and worshipped him. And provoked to anger the Lord God of Israel according to all that his father had done. That's the place Philip went. A place where idol was worshipped. Where are we to go today? We are to go to the world. What's the worship of the world? In Acts chapter 19 verse 27. Acts chapter 19 verse 27. Acts of the Apostles chapter 19 Verse 27, here we are told, so that not only this, our craft, is in danger to be set at naught, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world and the world and the world worship it. In the case of Samaria, they were worshipping Baal, and the world worshipping idol, worshipping Diana, worshipping the false god. And as Philip took the word of God unto Samaria, where idol worship had become the stay or the stability of their worship, which you were to take the gospel, the word of the Lord, unto the world, where many of the people are worshipping their idols. We're still learning about Samaria and then comparing that with the world. We're looking at Amos chapter, Osea rather, Osea chapter 7. Osea chapter 7, we're looking at it from verse 1. When I would have healed Israel, then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered and the wickedness of Samaria. You see, we're talking about Samaria associated with evil. 
We're talking about Samaria associated with idol worship. Now we're talking about a Samaria associated with wickedness. And here it tells us that the wickedness of Samaria was discovered. For they commit falsehood. And the thief cometh in. And the troop of robbers spoil it without. Uh, you, you will see then that as Philip received the commission, it was to go to Samaria. What picture did he have about Samaria? It was a city of wickedness, a city of robbery, a city of falsehood, and a city that was evil. And when you receive the commission to also go into the world and preach the gospel to them, if you are reading the news, if you are listening to what is happening around you, the world is a world of wickedness. And it's a world of evil. It's a world of idolatry. And it's a world of robbery as well. In verse 2 it says, And they consider not in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their own doings have beset them about and they are before my face. You see, the people of the world, they don't consider. Just like the people in Samaria, they were not considering it at all. That they were evil, just like the world is not considering. In verse 3, they make the king glad with their wickedness. And their princes with their lies. That means then, just like the world today, Samaria made their princes and their kings happy and joyful and glad by the wickedness, by the evil that they perpetrated. They will say they were perpetrating the evil to cover up the king or to protect the king or for the security of their king. And then by their lies and their falsehood, they were making the highly pleased people happy. In verse 4, they are all adulterers. So the Samarian and then Philip received the commission to go to such a place, Samaria, and then we too today were going into the world to preach the word of God. Remember once again what we learn in Osea about Samaria, their wickedness, their falsehood, and their robbery. Look at First John chapter 5. First John chapter 5, we're looking at verse 19. And we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in wickedness, just like Samaria. What was true of Samaria is true of the world today, that the whole world lies in wickedness. And yet, what was true of Philip taking the gospel, taking the word of God, the good news, the evangel, and taking the message of salvation to that wicked Samaria should be true of you. That you are also taking the word of God and you are taking it onto the world, the world of wickedness and the world of iniquity mm -hmm. and the world of falsehood and the world of robbery and the world of iniquity that as Philip had the grace of God and he had the strength of the Lord and the power of the Lord to take the gospel and take it to Samaria. So you, as a soul winner, you as an evangelist, you as a preacher of the word of God, should take this same gospel with the power of the Lord and take it to the world. The same thing, if Philip was able to overcome the wickedness in Samaria and reveal to them and show to them the way of righteousness and the way of truth how much more today with the spirit of God upon our lives we should be able to take this same gospel to the world of wickedness over there we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in wickedness in Romans chapter 3 verse 19 Romans chapter 3, we're looking at verse 19. Now, we know that what things soever the law said, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. As the Samaritans were guilty before God, now the whole world is guilty before God. And if you want to help the people of the world so they can be free from their guilt and their condemnation, do what Philip has done and take this gospel and take the word of God unto the guilty people of the world. I'm looking at Ezekiel chapter 16, looking at Samaria again. Ezekiel chapter 16. And I'm reading from verse 46. 
Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 46. And thine elder sister is Samaria. And she and her daughters that dwell at Hadletan, and thy younger sister that dwelleth at the right hand is Sodom and her daughters. Then you look at verse 49. This, behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness was in her. And in her daughters, neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. Now, you see that Samaria was linked, associated with Sodom. And God was saying, Israel, see what has happened to you. On the one hand, is Samaria. On the other hand, is Sodom. And as one is wicked, the other two is wicked. And this is what you'll discover that has affected Samaria. you find fullness of bread, abundance of idleness, and then they were not strengthening the, uh, the hands of the weak. And then it says, there was pride and haughtiness there as well. How about the world? The same thing you are going to find. Isaiah chapter 13. In Isaiah chapter 13, reading from verse 11. And I will punish the world for their evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. The same iniquity you find in Samaria, you find in the world. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. The same pride you find in Sodom and Samaria, you find in the world. And then it says, and I will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. It's just telling us that the world in which we live, very much like Sodom and Gomorrah, very much like Samaria. And yet, as the call came, as the commission came, and it came to Philip. And Philip immediately rose up, and then he went to Samaria. The Lord is challenging you and challenging me that the same eagerness and the same earnestness and the same faithfulness and the same alertness that Philip showed, that the same earnestness, alertness, and faithfulness and the same eagerness you ought to show. Uh, come to Jeremiah chapter 23. We're looking at Samaria. Jeremiah chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 13. I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. You see, as Samaria was worshipping idols, and they had wickedness, and they had iniquity, and they had idleness, and they had pride, and they had all these evil things. They also had false prophets. And that's what you find about the world today. And that's why, as you look at, you now appreciate the ministry of Philip, that even with all those uh, complex cities in Samaria, yet when he got the call, he went there and he preached the word unto them. And with the complex cities we find in the world today, you still take the gospel and you go to those places. I've seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal and caused my people Israel to err. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem an horrible thing. They commit adultery and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. Therefore does says the Lord of hosts. Concerning him, the prophets, behold, I will feed them with warm wood and make them drink the water of God. For from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. Thus says the Lord of hosts, hacking not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain that they speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. And so we discover that in Samaria, uh, there, was a false pro there were false prophets, and there was false prophecy. How about in the world today? In First John chapter 4, verse 1, we're comparing the world with Samaria. Samaria was the world. And as evil as Samaria was, so also the people of the world today are evil. 
And the same false prophecy and false prophets you find in Samaria, the same thing you find in the world today. And so the activities of those false prophets should not hinder our evangelism. It did not hinder Philip. And the same faithfulness that Philip had, preaching the word unto Samaria, the same faithfulness, we evangelists and so winners, believers, are to have today. First John chapter 4 verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. As the false prophets were in Samaria, so the false prophets are in the world today. As the deceivers were in Samaria, so the deceivers are in Samaria today. Second John verse 7. Second John verse 7. For many deceivers are entered into the world. Many deceivers are entered into the world. And the Lord has shown us very clearly that even though Samaria was bad, Samaria was evil, Samaria was wicked, and Samaria uh, was sinful, yet this uh, Philip the Evangelist, he went there, and the Lord is encouraging us, rise up and do the same. In fact, we are told eventually that the church actually was raised up in Samaria. And the church grew in the province of Samaria because of the activities of these men that were faithful unto the Lord. Acts chapter 19, verse, Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Then at the church's rest throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. Then at the church's rest. Churches were plant, planted in Judea, in Galilee, as well as Samaria, even though things were bad there before. And there was a lot of wickedness there before because of the faithfulness of people like Philip. And then Peter and John that were sent there later so they could have the infilling, the immersion, the baptism in the Holy Ghost. That's why we now have rest as well as spiritual edification in Samaria. And they were edified. They walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. I pray that as they were faithful, we too will be faithful in Jesus' name. I come to point number two, the message of the evangelist. The message of the evangelist. We come to Acts chapter 8, reading from verse 5. Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Before we look at the message, we need to look at the man. Because the man that makes the ministry is the man that proclaims the message. Is the man that performs the miracle. Is the man that does the ministration. Without the man, you cannot have the ministry. Without the man, you cannot have the ministration. And without the man, you cannot have the message. And so we need to look at the man. What kind of man was that? And as we look at this man, you look at yourself. Because Philip is no more here today, and you are charged with the responsibility. And you are charged with the duty of taking the gospel into the world. Just like Philip took the message of salvation. The message of redemption. The message of the new birth. And he took it to Samaria. What do you learn about the man? Number one, he was born again. He was born again. And if you're going to be a soul winner today, if you are going to be an evangelist today, you must make sure that you are born again with the evidence of the new birth and the new life and the transformation in your life. Number two, he was broken by love and bound by love. Broken by love. You see, all the other Jewish people, they had animosity against Samaria. And in fact, even the Samaritans themselves, they had hatred against the Jews. You remember what that woman said unto Jesus? I am a Samaritan and you are a Jew. How is it you are talking to me to give me a cup of water? Because the Jews and the Samaritans, they had nothing in common together. But Philip, he was broken by love and bound by love. Number three, Philip was baptized in the Spirit. 
Because you remember, when they were to choose those seven people that to look into the distribution of the food, the thing they wanted foremost was the very fact that they must be honest men, full of good report, and then full of the Holy Ghost, as well as full of faith. And so, if you are going to be an effective soul winner, an effective preacher of the gospel, an effective evangelist, you must make sure that one, you are saved, you are born again, and then you are sanctified. It is that sanctification experience that breaks all the things within, breaks everything down, and you are broken by love, and you are bound by love, love to the Lord and love to the lost, to the people. Then you are baptized in the Holy Ghost. Ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in Judea, and in Samaria, and then to the uttermost part of the earth, where we are today, to the world. Baptized in the Spirit. Number four, he was bold in the Lord. Well, you just read, he went down to the city of Samaria. You don't understand. Samaria was a city of robbery. A city of falsehood, a city of blood, a city of destruction, a city of violence. And yet, in the boldness of the Lord, bravery for the Lord, he went to the city of Samaria without even anybody with him. He was bold in the Lord and brave for the Lord. He went down alone without any fear and he declared the word of God unto them. Number five, he burnt with seal. There was zeal within him. It's like the zeal of the Lord has eaten me up. And if you are going to be an evangelist, you are going to be a soul winner, and you are going to declare the word of the Lord to your generation at this time in this world, there must be zeal within you. And there must be something that motivates you from within, stirring you up. It's not that somebody has to be dragging you and pushing you and, you know, encouraging you every time. The zeal of the Lord will consume you. Number six, he brought souls into the kingdom. In fact, the Bible says he brought the whole city into the kingdom of God. Brought the whole city into the kingdom of God and brought them to the Lord. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 8, I'm reading to you from verse 5 and then from verse 8. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. In verse 8, and there was great joy in that city. There was great joy in that city. Then number 7, he baptized many. Now that might look ordinary to you. But when you understand, he baptized all those people that came to the Lord. And they were not just 10 people. And they were not just a few people. I even want to say they were not just about a hundred people. It says the whole city. There was great joy in that city. And he didn't even have an assistant, a helper, that will help him and get the work done. And you think if, if you look around and look at the people here, all the people here tonight, they're not even up to the whole city of Samaria. And for this man feeling to stand all alone. And just stand in there and baptize the first one and baptize the second one and keep on baptizing them until they baptize all the converts in that city. That was a great job, a great responsibility. And he didn't run away from it because of the zeal of the Lord within him. That man burnt with zeal and actually did everything the Lord wanted him to do and baptize those people that came to the Lord in that whole city. And what an encouragement for you and for me. If Philip could do it, we can do it in Jesus' name. Amen. I said we can do it in Jesus' name. Amen. And then when you rise up and you stand up to your responsibility, to the calling of God upon your life, you will run, you will not be weary. Amen. And you will walk and you will not faint. Amen. And everything the Lord has appointed for you to do, you will do without the fear of man, and you will do without getting tired, as your days are, so will be your strength in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's look particularly at, we have looked at the man. That's the man. Now you want to see his message. Look at Acts chapter 8, verse 5. Acts chapter 8, verse 5. It says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. That's the message. He preached Christ unto them. And look at verse 30. 
reading from verse 30, here we learn, and Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. And the place of the scripture, which he read, was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so open, opened he not a smile. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself, of some other man. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. That's the message of the evangelist. He preached unto him Jesus. Chapter 9 of Acts. Acts chapter 9. Reading from verse 20. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither to, to that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priest? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. This is the very Christ. Acts chapter 17. Reading from verse 1. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, as his custom was, as his usual practice was, went in unto them. And three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead. And that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Do you see then the message of the evangelist? Is not preaching the opinions of men. Is not preaching religion. Is not preaching philosophy. Is not preaching old women's fables. Is not preaching ideologies. Is not preaching the tradition of men. Is preaching Christ unto them. Christ as a savior. Christ as the way, the truth, and the life. Christ as the mediator between God and man. Christ as the only Savior in Acts chapter 4. Reading from verse 11 and verse 12. This is the stone which was set at not of you builders, which is become the hedge of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, but for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. As we consider the message of the evangelist, there are four characteristics that are very important. And as you go out and evangelize, as you go out and you are preaching that same gospel as a soul winner, as an evangelist, there are four things that should characterize your message. Number one, the message is complete. Number one, the message is complete. Acts chapter 20. I'm looking at verse 20 and verse 21. And how I kept nothing back. Complete. The message that the evangelist is preaching must be complete. You mustn't, be, you mustn't look at the crowd and then be turned off by the crowd and become so excited because of the crowd. 
or you mustn't look at the personality of the person you are witnessing to and then be carried away by the personality you mustn't even look at maybe their initial response when they have not known the fullness of the message and then be carried away there must be completeness in the message how i kept back nothing that was profitable unto you but i've showed you and i've taught you publicly and from house to house testify both to the jew and also to the greek number one repentance toward god and then number two faith toward our lord jesus christ that's the complete message of the evangelist repentance on the one hand repentance from sin and then faith in christ as the savior that's the first characteristic so you ask yourself when you present the evangelistic message is it complete have you spoken about repentance have you spoken about faith in the lord jesus christ number two the message must be comprehensible comprehensible that's different from being comprehensive being comprehensive means it's complete but comprehensible understandable you must make the people understand if you speak in a language that is so high for the people and they don't understand then that's not an evangelistic message the people you are preaching to when you are preaching the evangel the gospel the good news and you are preaching salvation they are not people who have read the bible through they are sinners many of them don't know all these books in the bible and if you were to refer to Haggai or Zechariah or Osea or you were to refer to Esther or they will not know where to find them and so your message must be comprehensible understandable to the people you are preaching to Acts chapter 8 I'm reading from Bostachi and Philip ran thither to him and had him read the prophet Isaiah and said understandest thou what thou readest do you comprehend what you read and he said how can i except some man should guide me and he desired philip that he would come up and sit with him why so he can understand so he can comprehend and so that the message of life the message of salvation the message of redemption the message of the new birth, the message of being born again and being brought out of darkness and into the light of the glorious gospel should become understandable, should become comprehensible unto him. He told him, join me here and come and explain to me the place of the scripture which you read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before a shearer so open opened he not his mouth in his simulation his judgment was taken away and who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth and the eunuch answered philip and said i pray thee give me some understanding give me some comprehension i want to understand this of whom speaketh the prophet this of himself of some other man then philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him jesus how do we know that the eunuch understood how do we know that the eunuch comprehended what philip had been talking about yes yeah, how we know that he understood look at verse 36 and as they went on their way they came unto a certain water and the eunuch said see here is water what does hinder me to be baptized and philip said if thou believest with all thine heart thou mayest and he answered and said i believe that jesus christ is the son of god he understood he comprehended the message was comprehensible to him number one the message of the evangelist must be complete number two the message must be comprehensible number three the message must be convicting convicting in acts of the apostles chapter two but start at seven now when they heard this peter had been declaring the word of god the message of life the message of salvation and the gospel that will bring them out of their sin and bring them to the lord the savior when they had this they were preached in their heart 
And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? When you preach, there must be conviction in the hearts of the people. It must be convincing and convicting at the same time. They are convinced we need salvation. They are convinced Jesus is the Savior. And they are convicted they have been sinners. And now they want the Savior, the Lord, to be their Redeemer. And they are saying, just tell us what to do. Now we are ready. What shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, repent. And be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the removal, remission, forgiveness, cleansing of sin. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves, rescue yourselves, deliver yourselves, separate yourselves from this unto what generation and they that gladly received this word were baptized and the same day they were added unto them about three thousand souls number one complete a complete message number two comprehensible a comprehensible message number three a convincing convicting message number four a converting message the message should be converting and you are not there to entertain the people and you are not there to just say have a program to just have a crusade you are there so that the people who have not turned to the lord they will be converted so the message should be converting a converting message in first thessalonians chapter one first thessalonians chapter one verse five for our gospel came not unto you in watch only but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as ye know what manner of men were were among you for your sake and ye became followers of us you became a change took place a transformation took place a moving from where they were to where they are now as believers that took place ye became followers of us and of the Lord having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia for from you sounded out the word of the Lord not only in Macedonia and Achaia but also in every place your faith toward God to God word is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we add unto you and how ye turned conversion how ye turned to god from idols to serve the living and the true god so the message must be complete the message must be comprehensible the message must be convincing and convicting and the message must be converting, must convert the soul. Philip preached Christ, the Messiah, who the Samaritans were expecting. As he preached Christ, he presented him as Savior, through whose name we must be born again, we must be saved. He also presented him as a healer presented him as a deliverer in whose name the sick are healed and the demons are cast out as the new testament evangelists they proclaim christ's power to save christ's power to deliver and christ's power to heal let's look at now let's look at the result now we come to point number three the ministration of the evangelist the ministration of the evangelist we're looking at acts chapter 8 reading from verse 6 acts 8 verse 6 and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which philip spake hearing and seeing the miracles which he did you will notice in verse 6 there are two words there hearing there's a word to hear and seeing there is a sign to see on the one hand he preached the word of god unto them and they heard the word of god the people gave heed 
one accord to all that Philip spoke. And then they heard the crying out of those demons. And they also saw the healing and the miracles that he performed. Verse 7. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. And then in verse 12. And when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. There was something to see. There was something to experience. And there were miracles and testimonies. They saw and they heard. If there were no testimonies, what will they hear? And so, when we have a crusade, when the evangelist preaches, he gives time for the people to respond to the message of salvation. They repent of their sins. They are called to give their lives to the Lord. And they turn the way completely, totally from all their sins. They make a clean break, a total break, a complete separation from the old life, from the past life. And then they have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ who cleanses them with the blood of the Lamb and then transforms their lives as they come to the Lord. The penny man being Christ is a new creature. Old things are passed away and behold, all things are become new. And yet that's not the end. The evangelists will also give time for praying for the sick and praying for those who are tormented and praying for the people that need healing or deliverance in their lives. And that's then when you complete the work of the evangelist. Acts chapter, chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 6. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And they were told, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. In this case, Peter was ministering to just one person. And so Peter could say he ministered healing to him. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. But the man needed encouragement. The man needed assistance. And so Peter offered his own right hand and he lifted him up. When you are ministering to about 200 people or about 500 people or about 5,000 people, maybe about 50,000 people or even much more, you cannot go to all the lame people and lift them up one by one like Peter did. That's why the counselors are there. That's why the people that are walking along with the evangelists, that's why they're there. After the evangelists have prayed, in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. Those counselors, that's why we tell them, after you've collected the names, and you've written the names on paper, stay with the congregation and stay with the crowd, so that when the miracle prayer is made, then you help them, assist them, encourage them with words and with action in verse 7. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. After the lifting up, immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And then it says, while they all gathered them, and they wondered in verse 16, and his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And then from there he began to preach unto them. Verse 19, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. You see, we don't stop just with the miracle at the crusade. 
We don't stop with the miracle at the evangelistic outreach. We must preach the word of God, repent, so that your sins will be blotted out. In verse 26, unto you first, God, having restored his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. In turning everyone, in turning away every one of you from his iniquity. But chapter 4, verse 1. And as he spake unto the people, the priests, and the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold. On to the next day, for it was now even tide, how be, how be it, many of them which heard the word believed. And the number of the men was about 5,000. The number of those who are converted, about 5,000. Somebody must be feeling some form. Before you can count, these are the people that were born again as a result of that encounter. And somebody must be counting all those forms, all the cards, decisions, leaves that were filled. Before they could know, 5,000 in that single meeting. And even though Peter was not in the sight, in the scene anymore, because he had been taken by those religious leaders and had been taken to the prison, even in his absence, some people still did, did the counting. It is somebody filled the form, and somebody wrote down their names, and somebody did the counting and said, for that day, it was 5,000. Manifestation of the power of God. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5, I'm reading to you from verse 13. Acts, chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 13. Let's read from verse 14. And believers were the more added unto to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, in so much that they brought forth the sick into the street, and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. You see what we are saying here sometimes, there's not enough time to pray for everybody. And there wasn't enough time for Peter to go to everybody one by one and be laying hands on them and praying for them. But the people themselves, you will decide, this is my time and I receive my miracle and you receive in Jesus' name. The case of Peter the Apostle here, that they laid the people on their couches and the shadow of Peter passing by overshadowed them. And there, well, there came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing the sick poles and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. How many of them? Everyone, everyone. As we look at the ministry of this belief, the evangelist, what miracles do we see? Number one, miracles of spectacular conversions. Spectacular conversions. Number two, miracles of new lifestyle, transformation of character. Number three, we see miracles of healing. Healing of all kinds of diseases and deformities. Number four, we see miracles of deliverance from evil spirits. Miracles of deliverance from evil power. Number five, we we'll see miracles of breaking the yoke and destroying of all causes. And then number six, we we'll see miracles of various signs and wonders. Number seven, miracles of divine supernatural intervention. Divine supernatural intervention. The miracles were not limited to just healing. Look at Acts chapter 8 verse 39. Acts chapter 8 Verse 39, and when, and, and when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, and the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. And this uh, coming crusade time, a time of rejoicing. Yeah. You will rejoice. Yeah. Your neighbors you are bringing will rejoice. Yeah. Your family members will rejoice. And there will be supernatural miracles and divine intervention. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. Oh Lord, get us prepared. 
O Lord, get us prepared. O Lord, get us prepared for this miracle crusade that is coming. This redemption crusade that is coming. Deliverance crusade that is coming. O Lord, I want to be part of it. And I want to be not just an onlooker. I want to be a partaker. I want to be a person that will participate in that great crusade that is coming. You will get involved with the publicity. Announce it. Proclaim it. Declare it. Distribute the handbills concerning this crusade that is coming. It's going to be the greatest we have ever had. Your eyes will see. Your ears will hear. Your body will feel it. Your soul will know the impact of it. Get involved. Be a soul winner. Participate. Join the brethren in the publicity. And take the message out. Take the tracts out. Take the leaflets out. Take the publicity materials out. Get involved. Be a soul winner. Have some definite people in mind that you are going to invite to the crusade. Touch them at the point of their need. Let their need for healing be a point of contact. Their need for deliverance, a point of contact. Their need for answered prayer, a point of contact. Their need to move a mountain in their life, make that, make that a point of contact. And their need to come out of the oppression and depression from the enemy, make that the point of contact that you tell them, God is about to do the greatest thing and the greatest miracle in their lives. Invite them. Invite them. Maybe you want to develop Operation Andrew Cash. Each person inviting one, two, or three people. Making sure you bring them in. Making sure they hear the message of the gospel. And if you don't have enough transmission uh, equipment, there's a time to purchase more. And train more people that can handle them. Great things are happening everywhere. Many regions, many local governments, and many cities, many towns, many villages, even many homes. Maybe you want to contact the hospitals. You want to contact the prisons. You want to contact the schools. You want to contact institutions where you can have the receiver. And many people will be getting their problems solved, getting their souls saved getting themselves healed through this coming great crusade. Get involved. Pray for the conversion of sinners. Invite them and bring them in. Pray, believe, and expect the manifestation of God's power. All that you have heard has happened in other places. You pray. That at this time of the great visitation of the Lord, it will happen to you too. And when those converts come to the Lord, get involved in registering them, writing their names, giving them the cards, filling in their names, collecting the cards back. Get involved in the follow-up integrating them with the body of Christ, bringing them to the church. Pray that you will not be like Jonah, refusing the call of God, resisting the call of the Spirit. Pray that you will be like Philip, responding immediately, Responding positively to the call of God. And there is your chance to push all excuses aside and to say, Lord, I'll be involved. I will respond. Responsible. Don't be like Jonah. 
so that the wrath of God will not come upon you. So that there will be no raging sea or raging storm in your life. Pray, O oh Lord, make me like Philip. Responding obediently. Responding favorably. Responding positively. Responding urgently, immediately to the call of the Spirit. The call of the Spirit to preach the gospel. The call of the Spirit to tell the sinners how they can come home to the Lord. And then there will be a revelation from the Lord unto you. Don't wait until the sinners are rebuking you. You know something great like this is taking place. Why do you need to tell me? You know I could have my problem solved. Why do you need to inform me? You know God is performing wonders in that place. Why do you need to tell me? take me along? Don't let the sinners rebuke you. Let them respect you. Appreciate you. Let them thank you. That you are instrumental to their salvation. Instrumental to their healing. Instrumental to their miracle. Pray. That the Lord will give you eyes to see. Eyes to see the need around you. And a heart to respond immediately to the needs around you. Do the work of an evangelist. Do the work of a soul winner. Witness. Witness. In your neighborhood, witness. In your community, witness. In your school, be a witness. In the boss, be a witness. In your place of work, be a witness. Anywhere you find people gathered, be a witness. That's the work of a soul winner. And that's the call of God upon your life. Let there be the willingness in you. Lord, I am willing. And Lord, I am able. Willing. As well as able. Offer yourself to the Lord. Offer your time to the Lord. Offer your talent to the Lord. Get involved. Don't stay on the face. And let there be some winsomeness around you. But winsome. Tell the story of the cross appealing. Tell the story of redemption joyfully. And be winsome. Let your language, your action, your attitude win people to the Lord. Tell the Lord to give you wisdom. To say the right thing to the right person at the right time at the point of their need. And employ the weapon of a spiritual warfare. Prayer and faith to the Lord. Bringing those people unto the Lord. Telling the Lord to arrest their mind. And to bring them from the way of sin and bring them to the Savior. And pray that many signs and wonders will be done. And that that's the signs and wonders will not be limited to just one location. All over, everywhere, people will be listening. That the mighty power of God, the greatly, mightily manifested.